Thanks for having me along. Um, I've got a bit of a sore throat, so hopefully my larynx doesn't bloody explode while I'm trying to do this. <laughs> it's interesting while I wait, I'll just mention some random shit. Um, I'm, instead of putting up uh, structures on my slides today, I'm a chemist as well, like John, but I wore my periodic table t shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, when we talk to winemakers, they call that stuff chicken wire. So it looks to, to them, you know, these benzene rings and that, they look like chicken wire. So, um, yeah, so I haven't included any of that stuff. And I wasn't quite sure how I'd pitch this today, so what I've done is provide it, I'll provide a bit of background about the Australian wine industry um, and just take it for granted that the, accept, the success of the Australian wine industry to date is related to the science that has been ongoing for the last 50 or 60, 70 odd years in Australia. Um, and then I will touch on a couple of research topics that uh, on ones that I supervise my student and my postdoctoral guys. So hopefully I can drive this okay. So Wine's a wonderful beverage, right? Everyone loves wine. So if you guys are having some tonight, you might be, uh, if you have wine over a meal, you might play Goon of Fortune. Yeah. Um, and of course, politicians love wine for helping their mates out. They get a lot of wine. Um, so, you know, everyone can relate to wine in some way. Um, and I, you know, I research it, and it's a fantastic thing to me. It's an amazing natural product. So I'm a, I, I, did, I had nothing to do with wine when I did my PhD. I'm a synthetic organic chemist. So. We make the best meth in Adelaide, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then I learnt a lot of stuff at AWRI about wine and now I really love it. And it, yeah, it's, it amazes me every day. So it's a beverage that continues to change over time. You know, you can have a bottle of wine, um, you put it in your cellar and what it looks like today will not be what it's like in a year's time and things like closures and all kinds of stuff impacts that. So where are we going with this? Um, a little bit about wine style. So um, to, in, in terms of doing research, there's a heap of different wine styles that we need to think about. Uh, I'll put a, a bit of an example up here. So, you know, we have white wine, we have red wine, there's sparkling wine, there's fortified wine. Um, your grandma might like to get into a bit of sherry or something. Um, so there's a lot of different wine styles, like tons and tons of different wine styles. And um, there's different, obviously different grape varieties and that that feed into that as well. So, you know, there's really a huge, uh, an amazing array of things that you can do with different grapes and how you can make the wine in them. So not every, even if you take a certain grape variety, it doesn't mean that you necessarily need to just make a single wine style out of that. So wine uh, is, is made up of de uh, a lot of different chemicals. So that is probably a bad word to the general public, chemicals, but everything's a chemical. We're made up of chemicals. It shouldn't be something um, that you're scared of. Uh, one of, some of the main things are alcohol, obviously, is probably the main thing, that, the reason we enjoy wine so much, but potentially. Um, there's a lot of water, and then there's a small percentage of everything else. And that's really what we focus on, the everything else. So the everything else is on the right-hand side there, made up of things like um, acid aldehyde. So things in beer as well. We've heard a little bit about um, the sorts of compounds in beer, and, and there's certainly um, similarities between the, the aroma compounds in beer and wine, and lots of other things as well. That, these things on the right are not unique to wine necessarily, um, but there's minerals in wine, there's amino acids, organic acids, so the things that give it uh, the, the, the mouth feel of wine, so phenolic uh, compounds, but also aromas. So very small amounts of volatile compounds tend to give you uh, what's driving the aromas in wine, so esters, things produced by yeast, things that come from the grapes as well, things that come from oak barrels. So there's a little bit of a difference there, I suppose, with other beverages is that, uh, at least for red wine making, it gets stuck in the barrels and it sits there for a while and extracts other components and reactions happen as well. And then you pump it in the bottle, you stick it under a cork or a screw cap, which is um, obviously very popular in Australia and in fact invented in Australia, so there's an innovation coming out of Australian uh, research into wine. Um, so then things continue in the bottle, whether a little bit of air can get in through the cork or whether no air can get in through, through a screw cap, for instance, and you open, sometimes you might open a screw cap and you think, oh, it smells a bit pongy or whatever, and you pour it out and, and let it breathe a bit and then it comes good. So, but certainly, um, in that example, screw cap has really helped, has been a great innovation and it really helped preserve wine. Uh, I was just at Yolumba today with my class and I always remember a story at Yolumba. They have a, lots of wineries have a museum where they keep their wines from over the years, and Yolumba makes some really nice reasons and they have some reasons from, um, 60, in the 1960s when they were doing screw cap before anyone else probably. And then they went back to cork and then um, they went back to, to screw cap after that. But when they have a look at these wines, the ones under cork are cactus, but the ones under screw cap are still looking good and as, as good as they looked, you know, 
40 years ago when they were made, basically. So the sorts of things that we are interested in are on, on the right-hand side there, um, and trying to understand these things. A lot of my work is related to the volatile compounds, the, the things that smell nice in the wine, and also give it a flavour. Um, but I've also worked on polyphenols in red wine, or the tannins in red wine that give it, uh, that help protect the colour over the long term, and also give red wine its mouthfeel. So that astringent drying sensation that you get when you drink wine is, is related to the compounds that come from the grapes. So a bit about the winemaking process. We heard from John, and we saw a nice flow diagram about beer. So there's some similarities, but then there's a, real, a lot of differences as well. So we start with the harvest of the grapes, um, and whether it's red or wine, white wine making will be the harvest grapes, obviously. Uh, and then we, the, the grapes are crushed, and for white wine making, they're pressed straight away, so they're dumped into this crazy big robot looking thing here, um, at this point here. And then they go through fermentation, different fermentation vessels, it gets clarified, storage in barrels or tanks, um, then it's prepared for bottling and, and ultimately sits in a bottle um, and then gets sent out. Red wine, on the other hand, it's similar in terms of harvesting. Um, then there is crushing of the grapes, um, but the pressing doesn't actually occur until after fermentation. So a lot, not a lot of people understand, well, not that they don't understand, but I guess they don't know that white wine is not made on skins, whereas red wine is made on skins, and that's where you extract the colour and those tannins, and, and that's why they're very quite different beasts in the end, you know. Um, so you know, ultimately, it gets dumped into the press, um, and then uh, quite often with red wines as well, it undergoes what's called malolactic fermentation, so there's another thing going on there which introduces some other flavours, it uh, decreases the acidity a little bit, raises the pH, mellows that mouthfeel a bit, so um, that's another uh, bit of a difference between red wine making and white, so nearly all reds go through this thing called malolactic fermentation with um, lact lactic acid bacteria, so we heard John mentioning uh, the yeast and bacteria or microbes, uh, so this is where winemakers will actually add these things. Interestingly, they can also come from the vineyard. So wine, um, the grapes, we're not boiling them to kill any of that stuff off. And a lot of winemakers actually utilise these uh, these wild yeasts from the vineyard and it adds complexity and, and they can help make it um, the, the sort of style that they're after by leaving these um, indigenous yeasts in microflora and letting them, letting, letting them do their thing um, without killing them off. If they don't want those characters, um, and, and for most often, for most winemaking, you want the thing to get through fermentation. It's, it's obviously a, a disaster if you can't ferment those sugars out into alcohol and other things start happening as well. So winemakers will use SO2 and kill off all the indigenous yeast so we don't boil, but we can we use um, bisulfite, so the same thing that preserves dried apricots, for instance. Um, and that's why on your, on your wine labels you see you know, it contains sulfites um, because it's a preservative and an antioxidant that also knocks off the wild yeast. Then it's inoculated with a specific strain of um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast, and then that does its thing. It ferments the sugars and produces the alcohol and wine, plus it's a whole range of other uh, volatile compounds and, and other non-volatile compounds. So John mentioned polysaccharides and things like that, but also esters and higher alcohols and the, the types of things that make wine smell lovely. So just a bit about wine production. I want to try and highlight here um, how important uh, or, or just the rise of Australia in terms of winemaking. We're not, we're a new winemaking country, you know, there's, there's countries out there that have been wine, making wine for hundreds of years and that's not us, of course. But science has really helped put us on the world stage in terms of winemaking. So Australia produces about, or at least in 2014 figures, produces about 4.4% of the world's production. So we're up there um, with places like South Africa and uh, Argentina and that. So some of these countries are, are now starting to catch up with us. And probably some of that is because of the research that is produced in Australia gets snapped up by other countries and they can use it. So we're kind of crazy, right? We, we do this research, we do publications, and everyone can read them. And then they snap all these ideas and go and implement them in their, in their own wineries and make some super cool wine as well. So, um, But that's just the nature of it. Being scientists, we want to publish stuff. Um, and But ultimately, it still helps the industry do what they need to do. So in terms of volume and dollar value, um, you know, a couple of billion dollars in exports we're talking about a lot. You know, it's a it's a reasonable um, industry for Australia's economy. Uh, certainly employs tens of thousands of people. Uh, you know, producing uh, or exporting 750 odd million litres of wine. 
Um, you can see the export markets here. An interesting one is China now, really coming on strong. And you can imagine if we can tap into that, like right, the sky's the limit basically in terms of um, consumers, just sheer numbers of consumers. So 66% increase um, in, in the volume sent to China in, um, over that year. So that's, that's an amazing figure. You can see there was a little bit of a downturn, um, but we're starting to pick things up again. So the, you might have heard or read about there was a bit of a wine glut and that obviously devalued things. People were pulling out vineyards and that. But um, And the Aussie dollar obviously doesn't help. And when the Aussie dollar's higher, it, it you know, makes it harder for our exporters. So things have kind of turned around a bit and we're starting to pick up again. In terms of South Australia, um, South Australia is a really big player, and, and you know, at one point in time it was the major player in um, wine production in Australia and, and a number of vineyards. So, still at the moment, um, we produce about uh, you know a couple of million, or almost a couple, sorry, a couple of billion dollars, and about 500 odd million litres of wine. So about 43% of what's produced in Australia comes out of South Australia, which I think is pretty awesome. Like, I don't know if people appreciate it. We live right on the doorstep of these sorts of regions here. Um, you know, there's there's uh, a good dozen or so wine regions just right within our, uh, within half an hour or an hour's drive, places like the Barossa Valley or McLaren Vale, which you would have heard of, of course, but then things like Ratton Bully and Coonawarra and Langham Creek even, but Adelaide Hills is an amazing wine region, which is handy for us um, at the Way Campus, which I'll talk about in a minute. We can just shoot up the freeway and go, hey guys, we need some grapes, can we come in and raid your vineyard? And we're like, yeah, cool, no worries. So, <laughs> Um, in terms of, there's a couple of campuses, I'm going to talk about the university in a minute, we're going to plug, but uh, we have campuses at Wake in town and then at Roseworthy as well. Um, so in terms of the university, it's one of Australia's um, oldest universities, so established in 1874. Certainly has uh, the oldest enology and viticulture program in Australia, so I'm not sure if anyone recalls Roseworthy College, but it started there with some uh, diplomas and that, so in 1892, for goodness sake, was the first um, Enology elective at Roseworthy, and then the diploma in 1936. So, you know, about this time when we're training winemakers, we're also doing, starting to invest or, or look into cool science about wine as well. So then it moved across to the Wake Campus in the 90s, and now it's a, a really a dedicated Enology and Viticulture program. Um, the names change every bloody few years, but now we're called the Department of Wine and Food Science. We work at Horticulture, Viticulture, and Enology, and it's also the School of Agriculture, Food and Wine. But the idea about going to departments is this is sort of internationally recognised as the Department of Chemistry at universities or Department of whatever. So they went back to departments, and that's fine by me. I just had to change my email signature. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, uh, there's 12 academics out there. Amazingly, I'm one of them. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> and we work in different things. So I'm chemistry, but there's guys that can't even use <laughs> There's guys in sensory, um, microbiology, engineering, I don't know if everyone an engineer in winery, but um, great wine performance, biochemistry, so there's a heap of different researchers out there which really cover the whole research space in terms of um, grape growing and winemaking, which is really neat. So just have those guys so locally and, and be able to go and knock on their door and they hide behind the double desk. Um, we teach about 250 students a year, um, this is across the four years, so it's kind of interesting in terms of a, a, a bachelor's degree, usually they're three years and then you might do honours as a fourth year, our guys do four years straight up to get their degree, they can do honours in their fourth year as well, um, but yeah, it's kind of a long degree, but they do a lot of hands-on winemaking and this is a picky of our, um, of our winery up there, our, our research and, and also our teaching winery where the kiddies get to actually make their own wine a couple of times in their later years. Uh, we also have a, a stack of PhD and master's students, which is um, you know, a lot of our grant work. That's how we get it done. I'm rarely, I'm rarely in the lab, um, more or less glued to my bloody chair. I'm sure I'm going to park it in my chair one day, but <laughs> this is how we get our stuff done through students, and then we get grants and, and hire um, researchers, postdocs, and that. And I'm going to talk about some of the projects that they do. A little bit more about the weight, because this is also something we don't appreciate. Um, my old mate Peter Waite um, well, basically donated, he was an amazing pastoralist and had a great vision, I think, for the state of South Australia in terms of giving this a, a great amount of land to the university, right up there in the beautiful foothills in um, Springfield. 
and some you know, some of us like that, people died of like to subdivide that and build some massive mansions or whatever. So we're really lucky that um, you know. 90 odd years ago, we thought, hey, this is cool, I love the uni, I'm going to leave this to them. I just believed in agricultural research, so that was what's really neat. And now it, you know, it's the biggest um, research hub uh, for agriculture in the Southern Hemisphere, and you know, one of the biggest ones in the world, and most people don't even know what's, what's sitting up there. I know Adelaide Uni at North Terrace, but he forgets about us, so I can't blame everyone else for not really knowing what they are there as well. So, you know, we have a cool building, Wine Innovation Central. Uh, we have our winery there, um, a lovely Wake Agricultural Research Institute. Um, we have our own vineyard, it'd be pretty hopeless. You can see the city in the background there, actually. Pretty hopeless if we didn't have our own vineyard. But also, we're co located with different organisations, which really brings forward the power of, of the Wake campus. Um, so we have Australian Wine Research Institute where I used to work, so they're on second and third level here. Uh, I'm now on the fourth floor. If I get promoted, I guess I'll be on the bloody roof. <laughs> uh, we have an ARC Centre of Excellence in plant cell wall biology. And also this one here, the ARC. So ARC funds a lot of the stuff we do. Um, ARC Training Centre for Innovative Wine Production, and that's what I'm going to talk about a couple of their projects in a minute. Um, so the ARC, this training centre scheme, it's about um, providing or industry working with researchers to actually come up with innovative uh, solutions for industry, which helps make them more competitive, but also training scientists as well. So um, it provides PhD and postdoctoral training. So we have um, 12 PhD scholarships we've provided and three salaries for postdoctoral researchers which are basically like three or four PhD students in one, I suppose. Um, we've got about $3 million of funding over three years. And the beauty of it is also there's some input, both in kind and cash, from different industries. So you might recognise some names here, but they're basically wineries or um, organisations involved in the industry, plus also some of the partners that we're co-located with, like CSIRO um, and nobody else that I can see there. <laughs> oh, sorry, Australian Wine Research Institute and SARDI. But Treasury Wine Estate's a massive winery, okay, massive um, global um, wine brand there are involved, a, a, a mob called Memstar. And we also work with Charles Sturt University and DPI New South Wales, and obviously Australian Government, and even BioInnovation SA, and Tarek Technologies out in the Barossa, and I'll talk a little bit about the project that we're working on with Tarek. And the yeast company, the Ford, as well, you can't do much without yeast. So the overall objective of this training centre is to, uh, it has a portfolio of projects that span the production chain. So we're going from basically the vineyard uh, through to, to winemaking, to the glass and to the consumer and trying to make improvements um, in, in processes along the way there basically. And one of the main things is, and it might seem wacky as hell, but we're trying to actually um, work on ways of, of decreasing the alcohol content in wine, and I'll show you in a minute why that might be the case. But um, so, there's, and that needs innovative solutions. So there's, there's ways you can obviously just rip alcohol out of wine, but they're not going to make you know a really nice quality wine. There's going to be some imbalances there. We heard about a bit that, about that with the beer making and how you know if you just jack in some um, isolated compound from the hops, it, it's going to be out of balance. And a similar thing if you just remove alcohol from the wine and, and don't do much else, um, then it's not necessarily going to be a high quality wine. So this is kind of the crux of the issue really, and uh, we're dealing with rising alcohol concentrations in wine, so over the last 20 odd years, um, you can see a steady increase in, in uh, alcohol content in, in wines, this is red wine by the way, and um, there's a little bit of a drop off now, so people are becoming a bit more aware of it, but they're still not. Um, a lot of research done in terms of how can you remove or decrease the alcohol without affecting the product. So this is exactly what we're trying to work on. There was a bit of a wet year in 2011, a really hideous year. Um, obviously, um, grapes didn't ripen very well and it diluted the alcohol content. Um, but then you can see it started to pick up again. So there's a few different reasons why um, we're, we're interested in understanding how to manage the alcohol concentration in wine. So fermentation doesn't go through as easily if there's a high sugar concentration. So um, if the grapes accumulate more sugar, this is what's turned into alcohol. Uh, and if they're, obviously if they accumulate more sugar, uh, then they're not going to ferment as well. So there's, there's all sorts of issues which I won't go into around um, suboptimal fermentation. There's also funny-ish 
in terms of science at least, but the, the taxation issue, so depending on your export market, the, the tax on a, on a bottle of wine, depending on its alcohol concentration, can be 60% of the cost of the bottle of wine in the UK, for instance. So this, this kills our exporters, you know, it's really tough to have to deal with. And if they can just bring something, a wine down from 15 to 14%, it might still be just as, just as beautiful a wine as it was before, but they come in under a certain tax bracket and they can actually, you know, it's, it's more beneficial for our industry because we're trying to compete in a global market. So anything that is a benefit to the industry has got to be good in my book. So uh, there's also consumer preference, you know, you might go out to lunch and, you know, you've got to drive back to work or whatever, so you don't want to get half tanked on, on a bottle of wine at lunchtime. Um, or, you know, so there's, there needs to be lower alcohol, um, uh, lower alcohol products in that respect. But also, um, high alcohol wines can seem out of balance, they can seem really hot and, and, and the flavours aren't uh, in balance and, and the mouthfeel isn't quite right, so um, there's other issues going on there as well. So it's about the sensory perception and, and consumers wanting products that aren't as high in alcohol. There's issues around compressed vintages, so climate change is a dirty word, but it's real, take, take it from me. Uh, so vintages are being compressed, which is a struggle for winemakers. Um, unlike beer making, this is something that happens at a certain time of year called vintage. You've got like three months to get your grapes in and make your wine and fill your tanks and, and then the rest of the year is, is like obviously finalising that and, and um, putting it into bottle on that. But So if vintages are more compressed, this means, so fermentation might take five or seven days in the tank um, and the tank's tied up for that time. And ideally, if the grapes came in over some sort of steady period, it obviously helps facilitate do that wine making operation and they're all coming in at once um, then you need to make crazy decisions how can I get this one off out of the tank quicker and into somewhere else or whatever so it becomes a logistical nightmare so you're trying to help address that through um, some of the different projects we've got as well is a, is a bit of an issue so here they all have the, the projects are all listed here and I'll just give you a couple of minutes to write all them down <laughs> and, and then I'll focus specifically. So these are all the students who work on these things. You can see an early harvest regime I'm going to talk about and you know maybe it's a no-brainer but there's more to it like if the grapes are accumulating sugars and that turns into alcohol let's just harvest the grapes early and we'll have less alcohol. Um, but there's a little bit more to it than just that. There's things about potassium unloading and um, biochemical response of grapevines to, to smoke. So this is a really interesting one, which I don't actually talk much about, but I find it fascinating that you might have heard of the, say, the Samson Flat bushfires or whatever, um, can contaminate vineyards, and then the smoky character is on the grapes, and, and it's amazing, actually, that the grapes then will scrap a sugar onto that, and it goes into the grapes, and it, it becomes non-volatile. You can't smell the smoky stuff anymore. Um, but then you go and ferment it and after a little bit of time aging the bottle or whatever this gets released and it comes back again obviously that's a terrible thing to, to have to deal with so there's, there's some research into that how to prevent it or how to ameliorate that if it's happened there's things around microbes so um, John was mentioning uh, and I mentioned before about using indigenous or wild uh, microflora in winemaking so people are investigating things other than Saccharomyces cerevisiae which is the, the usual of wine making yeast, so there's all kinds of crazy things going on there. Um, and then using wine making supplements, so there's certain additives, there's about a list of 40, uh, 44 odd additives that you're allowed to add to wine, and they need to come from a certain source, often they're grape derived or oak derived or whatever. So there's projects around adding things into wine if you're going to harvest the wine at the grapes earlier and make a lower alcohol wine, then something might be missing in that respect, then it might be out of balance, so maybe you can add some sort of additive you can add grape derived tannins for instance and boost up that mouthfeel again um, and then a couple of or another one that I'm involved with uh, that I'll talk about a bit more is this um, recovering uh, basically using winery waste and trying to get value out of that winery waste so that's a really neat thing um, you can imagine we crush 1.7 million tons of grapes a year um, and I'll talk a bit more about this in a minute but that produces a lot of grape skins and seeds and stuff that needs to go somewhere um, and that contains sugars or it contains alcohol and you can do some cool things with that. So we're also investigating how to improve those processes. So in terms of this early harvest regime, I've got a you know, PhD student working on it. So normally in terms of grape ripening, it looks a little bit like, let me press the right 
looks a little bit like this. I'm not sure how many of you can see that, but the berries start real tiny and green and hideous, and they get bigger and bigger and hang out for a bit here, and then they start to get their colour later on. And this is obviously where we're harvesting um, red grapes at least, but it's a similar thing for whites, whites that same colour. Um, down the bottom here, you can see what we call bricks or sugar concentration. Um, and over here is the period that we want to ripen, so the flavours are nice and ripe, um, and the sugars have accumulated to the right level. But what you can see is it's basically a window, and you can harvest the grapes to give you a wine that's 11.5%, or it can go right out to 15 or even higher. You know, some McLaren Whale uh, wines that might be 16, 16.5%, and that's what's on the label, and there's a 1.5% leeway on, on what you put on the label. So, you know, they can be really high in alcohol. Um, but the, the point is that, you know, we can bring things back this way a little bit and hopefully still have the right amount of flavour, but just have less sugars that need to ferment to ultimately um, turn into alcohol in the grapes. So the approach is kind of looking at that sort of thing, harvesting the grapes earlier, they'll be lower in sugar, beautiful. But also, you know, they might be a bit, they might be greener characters and, and things might be a bit, you know, they might seem underripe and that's a possibility as well. The other option is to harvest some grapes earlier, harvest some grapes at a normal time, make wine out of these things and blend them together. So that's an option for decreasing alcohol concentration as well. Another one that we can't do, but doesn't mean we can't investigate things in terms of research, is add water. So winemakers are allowed to add, in terms of when you make additions to the wine, um, doing various things, you, they can add a maximum of 7% water at the moment. They want to try and raise that to, you know, not exactly unlimited, but um, in terms of being able to decrease the, the sugar concentration of the must down to something that's a bit more reasonable. And, and it's not about diluting things, it's about having, allowing these things to go through fermentation where they might otherwise be problematic when it's a very high sugar must. But obviously the outcome is um, decreasing the alcohol content ultimately. So the sorts of things we look at, our students made a heap of wines um, in, in replicated wine making trials as well. It's very important to replicate these things to make sure that what you see is actually what's happening. Um, and then we do lots of chemical measures and sensory analysis um, and, and try and figure out what's going on in that respect. Uh, because ultimately we want to, you know, we're only talking a couple of percent. If we can knock a couple of percent off the concentration of alcohol in the wine, we'll, we'll come under that tax barrier. Um, the wine might, it won't be as hot, it'll be more in balance. You can quaff a bit more at lunchtime or whatever. So, um, you know, these are, it's, it's heading in the right direction, but obviously the, the research is lacking. It's quite a new approach to doing this. There are, you know, I'm not talking about our, um, other ways you can do that, about de and that, so there's technology out there to actually remove alcohol out of wine. Um, and and they, these are some of the things we're investigating as well. But in terms of consumers, so if you knew someone that messed around with your wine and pulled some alcohol out, would you be happy about that? Would you rather they did it in some sort of natural way and they harvested the grapes earlier or they used some wacky yeast strain? You know? So I think consumers would tend to Wine, there's some nostalgic thing about wine that it shouldn't be messed around with too much. If you knew how wine was made, you'd probably freak out. Um, <laughs> the bloody green caterpillars I've seen in picking bins and stuff. But, but, you know, I mean, we eat macas and all kinds of stuff. You never worry about that. Anyway, so. <laughs> yeah. You never give a thought about what you're putting in your mouth, really. You just take it for granted it's safe. And of course, I don't know anyone that's ever been poisoned. Uh, apart from alcohol poisoning, but from drinking <laughs> wine. It's an amazing thing, right? It's something that lasts forever. There's no, apart from a bit of SO2, you don't really preserve wine. It doesn't have, really have a use by date or anything. You know, it, can, it can hang around forever, so it's an amazing product. So what we've done, we take uh, grapes at a certain, what we call, um, what we call green harvest here, so they've barely got any colour, really low in sugar, really high in acid, so as grapes ripen, the sugars come up, the acids go down, um, the pH uh, elevates a little bit. So really early wine, we make um, a 5% alcohol wine, like a hideous thing that you can't drink, obviously. Dissolve your bloody teeth in a minute. Um, we strip a lot of the horrible green flavours out in that by using charcoal and a thing called bentonite or clay um, and make a really, just a, a low alcohol acid water, basically. And this is what we're going to be able to blend uh, with the, the grapes that we harvest at the normal commercial maturity. So those guys are over here, what we call the control. Um, and then along the way, we also harvest um, parcels a bit earlier, every couple of weeks at a certain um, bricks or, or bome level, a certain sugar content. 
um, and turn that into wine as well. So you can see here some of these, the Harvest Series wines, we've got 11%, uh, 13%, 15%, and we're going to do some chemical analyses on these and understand whether they're any good or not. And then we've got what um, would be the normal commercial harvest. I mean, this one got away from us and from the, the winery as well, but 18% uh, wine, uh, this is what it made in the end. And this is the sort of thing we're talking about. This is real world stuff because what happened last year got really hot and it was dry, the berries shrivel, um, so you, they have those juice in them, so there's obviously a concentration effect. Um, and that's what, this is exactly the sort of thing we're trying to investigate to, to try and give winemakers the techniques to overcome that sort of thing. So this was kind of a good year to do that project in, in as much as it was a very real situation. It wasn't optimal for what we wanted to do, but it was very real in terms of what winemakers have to deal with. So you can see, I don't know if you've ever seen berries really, but they don't look like that. Usually, that looks more like raisins or sultanas or something. So we made this wine, 18 percent and that's what we blend with the, the green harvest wine, and we also blended it with water. So they look a bit like this. Uh, we have really high-tech fermenters there at the university. Um, so this is different percentages of the green harvest wine or water into there to try and get the same alcohol concentration for that one and that one or that one. That. So this was made, this is the um, commercial or maturity wine that we made, the 89%, and then it got blended with either the green harvest wine or water. And to not alter the, the juice to solids ratio, we run some uh, some of the juice off of, uh, of this must here, it's called a must when it's got the solids and the juice, we run some of that off and replace it with the green harvest wine or the water. In fact, when you run the must off like that, that's what turns into rose other wine. So, you know, this is another part of winemaking. Um, picks up a little bit of colour, but not too much. And you, you know that a rosé wine is very different to a red wine. Um, so we end up putting it in the bottle. We did all uh, take it through all the winemaking process. One thing that we don't do, and very rarely, if ever, do with research wines, they never see oak. So every red wine you would ever try is basically being an oak or had some sort of oak added to it. So we, don't, we didn't do that, and we tend not to do that. We, research scale wine so when it comes to tasting these they're a little bit different to, to tasting a commercial wine but nonetheless we can still do you know, full sensory analysis on these and um, we have trained panelists that taste these wines and try and describe what their aromas, flavours, the sensory characteristics are. So you can see here that we've made wines that are about 14 percent, 16, 17 percent and tried to match it up um, with the wines that we also made where we added water instead of the green harvest wine. And of course, if I just go back a sec, you know, this is way beyond the, the water that you're legally allowed to add at the moment. So I mentioned before it was 7 percent. So you know, we're really pushing the limits there, but they're trying to get those regulations changed. Because it's not an even playing field in other countries they are allowed to add water to dilute their must um, because of the high sugar concentration and the problems with fermentation. But of course that ultimately gives you a lot of alcohol wine. So, you know, I think the industry here and, and the, the regulation body uh, moves quickly when it needs to, and if it's uh, in terms of um, market share or things that are going to impact on, on Australian winemakers in the global uh, scene, then, then they'll move and act on that and change the regulations. Not all of them are important either, um, but if you have a look at this guy here, so this is a green capsicum aroma, all we wanted to do was make sure so that earlier you harvest the wine, um, in terms of cabernet, at least the greener it will be, so the more of this compound it will have and it actually degrades as the grapes ripen. And ultimately, when you get to um, commercial ripeness, you hope there's a relatively low level of this green compound, although it is characteristic of that varietal. So, you know, it's important in terms of being there, but you just don't want heaps of it. So, um, if you see here, it's hard to see actually this grayed out area here is what we call the aroma detection threshold. So the point at which you might smell that there's something there, you might not necessarily say it's green capsicum, but and certainly at this level here is where it becomes an obvious green flavour. So we want to be um, below that, or at least not um, you know, not too far above that. We want to maintain the varietal characteristics, but you know, if someone wants to be green capsicum, they'll go and buy it and never sell it and still <laughs> so, um, I'm just showing you here that you know, we've managed of, of course you see that early harvest wine, it's true to form, that it's it's very green. Um, but then as we go along, as the grapes get riper, it's less green. There's some other things going on there that you can probably pick out, and I'm sure you'll have questions about that one in particular, perhaps, what's going on there. Um, but I won't bother uh, worrying about that at the moment. 
So we also do sensory characters, and thanks to John before for showing um, this, this plot, similar plot that he did before, which is a way of how we quietly visualise what's going on with the aromas, flavours, the mouthfeel and that. Um, so we, you know, we, we do this to compare the wines against each other and, and try and understand, you know, we can do all the chemistry we like, and it's, I love it, it's great, but if people, you know, when people, the ultimate test is when people come to drink this stuff and, and you know, consumers, you need, you need people to, you need to be able to sell it in the end. So sensory is very important. So that's kind of, a, it's almost the starting point where we start and, and where we end as well with the sensory focus in mind. So we were able to produce wines that spanned you know, 11% right up to 18%. So a massive range, something you can't do with just tweaking the yeast or you know, mucking around in a lot of other ways that are available to winemakers. You'll never get a 6% decrease in alcohol or 7% decrease in alcohol like you can here. Um, there's also, importantly, you don't want to see any differences between these treatments sensorially. So it was neat that, um, at least for most of them, they all looked very similar. So you could harvest those grapes a bit earlier, a few weeks earlier, have a lower alcohol, potential alcohol concentration, um, and they look as good as the wine that, that you might have left to ripen um, to full maturity. So this is a you know, really useful outcome. There's always interesting things that come with doing science, and whether you can chase them up or not is another story, but we found, so this hotness that I mentioned before, it's usually driven by alcohol. So if there's higher alcohol, the, the wine tends to be hotter. Um, but we didn't find that it wasn't necessarily the case here, so there might be other things um, underpinning, uh, underpinning um, hotness in a wine, so either matrix components, and we need to look at that further. So um, my, P my PhD students, three year PhD, will probably become five, and that's pretty typical for the sort of thing that we're doing. <laughs> no, I'm joking, they've got to be out in three. <laughs> <laughs> so another one, this, this reusing waste, um, idea is, is really cool. So every industry obviously generates waste, some more hideous than others. It's not so bad if it's just a pile of what we call grape mark, the leftover skins and seeds. This is a massive, massive shed and this is, I don't know, tens of thousands of tons of grape mark sitting in there. And you know, in smaller regions it'll be spread in a vineyard or given a cattle to munch on or something like that. Um, but there's things you can recover. You can see it's red so there must be um, pigments that you can recover, so natural components that might be really useful, certainly tartaric acid, so um, at this uh, place that we work with, they, they recover tartaric acid, which can then be used again in the winemaking process. But one of the big ones, what do you think might be left in there? It's always risky asking questions. <laughs> Sorry? Alcohol. Alcohol, bloody earth. So, <laughs> you know, particularly with a... Uh, I've, seen yeah, with, I've seen drunk cow. Yeah, all right. We should have had a pint glass given <laughs> Um So if it's a red wine ferment, obviously there's alcohol left in here. And that's what this wacky thing over on the side here is. It's not some bloody scale electric kit. It's, um, it's a five column distillation setup that they've got out there at New York. Um, and they use that so they steam distill the alcohol out and jam it through this five column setup here and produce neutral spirit. Um, so what we're trying to do is work with them to figure out how can we improve both the yield of alcohol that they obtain from this process and also the quality. So um, even though you distill it and you know, that's a, a very highly purifying process, there can still be small amounts of components that will make that alcohol not very good quality. Um, and you can hide it in different ways, but if you're trying to produce a brandy spirit, which they do, or this neutral alcohol, um, which is, is used for fortifying wines or doing other things, but then you want a really nice clean spirit. So any way that we can help them out to, to basically do the same thing that they do, but make it make more of it and cleaner, they're going to allow us. So a little bit more about Mark. I, I mentioned that there's uh, 1.7 million tonnes of grapes crushed, so you know, a good percentage of that, hundreds of thousands of tonnes, maybe up to 30% fresh weight of, of the grapes that are crushed becomes this mark that the industry has to deal with. Uh, so that's why we're working with them. The sorts of things that um, involves is the skin, seed, stalk seed, so, you know, unusual stuff coming from grapes. Uh, in terms of white mark, so during the white wine making process, you might recall I said earlier, the grapes are crushed and then they're pressed and then they go to fermentation. So there's lots of sugars left in, in white mark, whereas in red mark, the grapes are ferment, they're crushed, fermented, and then they're pressed. So then there's lots of alcohol left in red mark. So you're dealing with different beasts here and there's different things you need to do. 
um, and we're trying to help them improve the processes on both sides. So that big pile of red mark I showed you, that just basically gets steam distilled straight away. The white mark actually has to undergo fermentation to convert those sugars into grape alcohol. So that needs to sit around in heaps or in some way um, sit around and, and let those sugars ferment into alcohol before it can be distilled. So there's lots of things to, to look at to improve that process there. And some of those things are around optimising the size of the mark, so you know, maybe making it smaller pieces, get rid, getting rid of the seeds. Is there enough nutrients in there? Do you need to add yeast? Or is there enough yeast to see one of it that's going to do its thing? So there's a lot of these things that um, my postdoc's been investigating. So he's gone the high tech route again. Um, things like just a lab oven with my foil trays and um, an overhead stirrer with some wacky <laughs> bucket things and some really cool little mini distillation apparatus, don't tell the tax office. No, these are less than five <laughs> litres, so you don't need to have them registered, thank you very much. <laughs> you can buy these at um, beer brewing places, they're really neat, so they're really useful for what we're trying to do to slam. Otherwise, the distillation setup is just a bit of a nightmare in terms of trying to determine the recovery of alcohol. That's what the end game is. Any of this wacky setup, we're, we're trying to ultimately look how much alcohol do we get out of it. So to do that, we need to distill it. These are beautiful little pieces of kit to do that. So we all care about the alcohol, it's just give me the bloody answer they say. Um, so here is kind of their baseline data, um, that red line there, so about 6% they were getting. So a bit of, almost doesn't matter what these things are, but the fact of the matter is that whatever we do, we can get a bit more alcohol, in some cases a lot more, so two or three times. You know when we started this, we were looking at, if we could do one or two percent increase, that would be awesome to them, that would make, you know, that, that, that helps their bottom line incredibly. Here we're talking, you know, two or three times as much alcohol, and you know we're trying to work on the quality as well, which means there's less waste too. So um, we're heading in the right direction. They love us. Um, and they just trying to get, trying to get them to track more money on us. <laughs> of course, always. Uh, so what we can do in the lab, then you go and scale it up. And pharmaceutical chemists would know, would know all about this, and I always remember a story of. You know, we do things in the lab, and I don't know if you know about sodium, it's this shiny metal, and you use little pieces and you plug them in a thing. I always remember this talk from a guy that did, did uh, pharmaceutical things, synthesis, and he's talking about a thousand kilogram big block of sodium and chopping bits off it. Like, you know, the scale up and trying to deal with that stuff is just incredible, and it's a similar thing here. So what we can do in the lab now, we have to figure out how to scale it up um, in a sensible and, and the way that they can actually do with the infrastructure. And, in a way that makes sense to them. So we could come up with any process we like, but if they can't actually implement it in industry, then um, you know, it's cool in terms of an academic exercise, but it doesn't transform the industry, and that's what we're trying to actually do with this training centre. So I guess to summarise all that stuff, thanks a lot for hanging around. I'm glad you came back after the, the beer tasting, and I was a bit worried, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, to summarise, so, you know, the advances and hardly any of what I've talked about today, but you know, this, this is the ongoing stuff. The advances so far um, in, in scientific knowledge have really underpinned the success of our wine industry and really put us on the map in terms of um, Australian wines and being recognised and the quality of the wine, that's what it is. You know? It's not, uh, Australia's cool like kangaroos and we put them on our label and they sell like hotcakes in the US. No, that's partly true, but the wine, it can't be crap, it has to be good and that's what we're known for, you know? So it almost doesn't matter what, like, almost whatever wine you buy, it's going to, you know, it's going to be a good quality wine, from a clean skin to to a hundred bucks bottle of wine. You know, so that, that's really where science has got our industry and where we are today. And now we're trying to push the envelope and, and do lots of more cool stuff because there's always things coming along, um, challenges for the industry and climate change, being one of them, managing alcohol. Um, so in the early days, it was about controlling pH, something as simple as a pH meter and measuring the pH of a wine going, oh, it's a bit high, let's chuck some tartaric acid in, and it knocked off the microbes. SO2 is much more effective at a lower pH. So simple. But, you know, without people doing that research and um, the guy at Penfolds in the 1930s, you know, hammering his boss to buy him a, an expensive pH meter and the boss going, yeah, cool, let's do that. Transform the industry. It's amazing stuff. It gives me those goosebumps. <laughs> um, things around oxidation, understanding wine colour. Um, yeah, and then, so... <laughs> um, yeah, because I love the shits really quick. <laughs> um, 
Uh, yeah, so now more around um, understanding what we've got and managing it, so objective measures of quality. Wouldn't it be really neat to go to the vineyard and bend some bloody light onto the grape and go, all right, it's ready to harvest now, take it to the winery, you need to do this and that with it and turn it into this sort of wine. That's kind of where we're looking forward, uh, or looking towards now, we're not at that point at the moment. And also more about understanding composition um, of the grapes and the wine and, and the sensory outcomes and then taking that on to consumers because as I mentioned if people aren't buying wine it could be the best wine in the world but you know if it's just sitting in your warehouse because people aren't buying it doesn't do much good so um, we really have to have a focus on consumers um, ultimately uh, that's our approach I guess with this training centre is starting in the vineyard understanding how we can manipulate things in the vineyard taking that through the processing operations in the winery what do we need to do to make the best wine from those grapes and then ultimately through to uh, the consumers and, and marketing is another thing again but I don't really dabble with that stuff so overall this training centre is about training um, tomorrow's industry ready scientists so hopefully they can go out and um, work with the sorts of industries that we're doing research for um, and keep doing the sorts of cool things that we're doing so nearly there uh, a few people think it's never something you do on your own Although plenty of people, when they talk about their stuff, it's almost like they're the only one that ever bloody did it. Um, but there's always plenty of people involved, and you, you always forget to thank some people. But yeah, some of my students here and um, collaborators at Australian Wine Research Institute, and Treasury Wine Estates. Of course, we need the money from somewhere, so that's the government comes into that. <laughs> and um, the MOOC. You heard about the MOOC, guys. So if you want to know more than what I've covered in probably too long tonight, um, go and sign up six weeks, you can get six weeks of this stuff that's gold, right? So, um, in, on July 7, it opens up, free online course, a couple of hours a week. Um, you can go and hear from me, and you've probably heard enough of my voice, but um, you can hear from some other uh, lecturers that I work with that I show you here. These are a couple of our awards that we won. Pretty happy about that, but um, yeah, come and say good day to us online. In fact, so this has been running, this course they asked us to run it again. Um, and the next one we're relaunching it again, we're actually going to be there and interact with people on the discussion boards, and, which we did the first time around. It takes a lot of work, but it's really enjoyable. And that's it. Woo! Woo!